Let's begin by offering our respects to ISKCON founder Acharya and our preeminent Shiksha Guru, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Good morning, Hare Krishna. Good morning. नमस्ते सरस्वते देवे गौरवानी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देशतारिणे हे कृष्ण करुण सिंधु दीन बंधु जगतपते गोपेश गोपिका राधा नमोस्तुते तप्त कंचन गौरंगी राधे वृंदवनेश्वरी वृषभानु सुते देवी प्रणमा हरि प्रिय वाचकलपतरूव्यश्च कृपा सिंधु व्यच पति पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवासादि गौरभक्त वृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे प्लीज रिपीट आफ्टर मी ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओके वी वेलकम ऑल ऑफ यू टू अवर वीकली भगवदगीता क्लासेस वी हैव इट आंटी नीता आजा आयुष दीप्ति अदनानी दुर्गा प्रसाद हरमन बक्शानी करुणा जाधवानी खुशबू लाल एंड महक मेलवानी देन वी हैव लवीना मंजू एन सी वेंकटचारी माय पेरेंट्स आर देयर वी हैव रीटू लालवानी साकेत वी हैव शालिग्राम प्रिया देवीदासी श्री राधे हरि देवीदासी वी हैव शिवानी एंड वृंदा गोपिका माता जी एंड जस्ट नाउ Ranjit has joined us. Okay. So what did we see in the previous class? We saw Arjuna's realizations and Arjuna's acceptance of Krishna as the supreme personality of Godhead. And uh, it's not that Arjuna did not accept him before. Arjuna knew beginning itself. that krishna is the supreme personality of god <clears throat> because if it was not for that then he would have not um, chosen krishna 
over Krishna's entire army when the choice was given. No, Krishna said, you either get me and I will not fight in the war or you get my entire Narayani Seva, no, my entire army. That time Arjuna chose very happily, without any doubt in his mind, immediately he chose Krishna. So Arjuna was, of course, from before he was aware that Krishna is God. But here um, he is playing the role of the living entity. So we see how Arjuna then shares his realizations no, in chapter number 10 of the Bhagavad Gita. And how does uh, Arjuna accept Krishna's instructions? Arjuna says, I totally accept as truth all that you have told me. So we were discussing how uh, it's important that we should accept as truth everything that Krishna says and not accept that which is favorable and reject that which is which is difficult for one to follow. No, Everything is favorable. Everything is for our well-being. But sometimes some instructions um, may be difficult for someone to follow at a certain point of time. But irrespective of whether I can follow it or not, I should accept everything as truth. That is the lesson that we get from Arjuna. Then Arjuna goes on to say that um, uh, neither the demigods nor the demons can understand Krishna. So who can understand Krishna? Then Arjuna says that you alone yourself know by your own internal potency. Uh, you know, so Krishna only knows himself. Nobody else can understand Krishna fully, Arjuna is saying. And then Arjuna requests, requests Krishna to share his opulences, to describe his um, opulences, his vibhutis. And then upon Arjuna's request, Krishna goes on to describe his opulences. But he says only the most prominent ones. No, not the. He says that he's not going to explain all, but the more prominent ones. The reason is because uh, Krishna's opulences are Ananta, unlimited, and our intelligence is very, very limited. So Krishna says that he will explain the more prominent opulences, and then he goes on to explain his opulences. So we stopped at where did we stop? Verse number thirty-two to start. Yeah, we have to start from thirty-two. Thirty-two. Okay, let me share my screen. Anybody who has never read in our classes would like to read today? Can I read? Yes, Ayush. Thank you. Okay, let's hear the verse. One second. Srotasamasmi janavi Sarga namadirantascha Madhyam chaiva hamarjuna Adhyatma vidya vidyanam Vada prabadatamaham Of all creations, I am the beginning and the end, and also the middle. O Arjuna, of all sciences, I am the spiritual science of the self, and among logicians, I am the conclusive truth. So Krishna continues to describe his opulences, and here he's saying, of all creations, I am the beginning, I am the end, and also the middle. So he's Adir, he's Anta, and he's also Madhyam, Krishna is saying. Then what does he say? Of all sciences, I am the spiritual science of the self. Because this is the most important and it's the first lesson of spiritual knowledge that one is, what is what is self? What are we? You know? Who am I? I am spirit soul. I am not this body. I am not what I see in the mirror. What I see in the mirror is only temporary. So first, uh, first lesson of spiritual life is to understand our identity, to understand who we are. Because if we don't understand that, then we cannot proceed in our spiritual life. So Krishna says, of all the sciences, I am the spiritual science of the self. And of and among logicians, I am the conclusive truth. Vada, Krishna says, Vada. So of, of all the pravadas, all the arguments, he says that he is Vada. So what is this? Let us try to see in the next slide. See, there are different ways to reach a conclusion. So what are they? Jalpa, Vitanda and Vada. 
So what is Jalpa? Jalpa is bad argument. The aim of a Jalpa is to gain victory. The debater may purposely find fault in the opponent's statement in order to establish his own argument as correct. So when there is Jalpa, then the goal is that I should be, I should emerge victorious. That is the, uh, that is the whole goal of that uh, argument. Then comes Vitanda. Vitanda merely trying to defeat one's opponent is called Vitanda. This quibbling or merely destructive argument in which one tries to defeat the opponent by any means possible does nothing substantial to positively prove one's own thesis. Instead, all the focus is on putting the opponent down. So in Vitanda, the whole focus is I want to defeat my opponent. I want to put down my opponent. No, That is the whole goal. So neither Jalpa nor Vitanda are the proper ways to reach a proper conclusion to reach the right conclusion so what is the what is the um, argument or debate by which one can come to a proper conclusion is vada what is vada vada is an honest debate carried out fairly according to standard rules it is the actual conclusion the conclusion does not contradict a tenant or accepted doctrine aim is to establish the decisive conclusive truth this conclusive truth is a representation of Krishna, which Krishna said no, in the in the shloka we saw. So vada means the when there are two uh, personalities or two teams or two groups uh, having a debate, the goal is to uh, to come to a proper conclusion. The goal is that the truth that is coming out of it should be correct. It does not matter whether I am wrong. It does not matter with if the other one is correct. That's not what matters. What matters is that finally the truth should come out. For example, in the court of law, when the judge establishes his, when the judge gives his verdict, then that is vada, right? He is, he is not, um, he is not, he wants to come to a correct conclusion. Ideally, the judge should come to a correct conclusion, no? And, and, and hold someone responsible for a crime or if somebody is innocent to declare that person as innocent. It's not that he's, he wants to favor one party or he wants to put one party down or he wants to, that's not the goal. The goal of that, the whole court proceeding is that the judge should come to an honest conclusion at the end of it. So like that, this vada is an honest debate. And the goal is that at the end of it, the correct conclusion must be established. So Krishna is saying that. Among logicians, I am the conclusive truth. Let's go to 33. Of letters, I am the letter A, and among compound words, I am dual compound. I am also an exhaustible time, and creator, and of creators, I am them. So of letters, I am the letter A. See, if you see uh, any alphabet in Sanskrit or Hindi can be completed only with the A sound. If So when we say K, it is half K and then A. Uh, the A sound is added, no? So when this is complete, then only because of that A sound only, because of that A, only we can complete that alphabet. So K, K, G, G. Without the A sound, it cannot be completed. Therefore, Krishna is saying, of the letters, I am the letter A. And among the compound words, I am the dual compound. Now, what are compound words? Compound words are formed when you bring together two different words. They are brought together and then a third word is formed, which is which gives you the uh, a third word. For example, sun plus flower gives you sunflower. So the compound word is sunflower. The word sunflower is composed of two other separate words. So these are called compound words. Or another example would be make up. Make plus up is actually make up. So make up is a third word that is formed <clears throat> by bringing together <clears throat> two separate words. So these are all called compound words. Now what is a dual compound? In a dual compound, both the words that are brought together have the same importance. Sometimes in compound words, one word may be more important, more prominent than the other word. But in a dual compound, both words are equally significant. 
For example, when we say Mata Pita, Mata Pita is a dual compound. Or we say Ramakrishna. Ramakrishna also is a dual compound. So in a dual compound, so amongst the compound words, the dual compound is more prominent because both words have equal importance. Both words have equal significance. Okay. Then Krishna says, I am also inexhaustible time. So time is something that exhausts everybody else. Now one may, one may work and uh, or over a period of time, one is growing old, one is becoming physically or mentally weak. So time is something that exhausts everybody else. But time never gets exhausted. Time continues. No, Time never stops, but time never uh, gets exhausted. So Krishna is saying that I am inexhaustible time. And of creators, I am Brahma. So we know how Lord Brahma uh, creates. No, That is the job. That is the service that is assigned to Lord Brahma. So Krishna is saying of the creators, I am Brahma. God is not a being who exists in time. He is the being because of whom time exists. So time is existing because of Krishna and not vice versa. This is the reason why Krishna does not grow old. Krishna eternally lives in Goloka as a 16 year old boy. 34 Mrityo Sarvaharas Chaham Udbhavascha Bhavishyatam Kirti Hishivak Janarinam Smritir Medha Dhritikshama I am all devouring death and I am the and I am the generating principle of all that is yet to be. Among women, I am fame, fortune, fine speech, memory, intelligence steadfastness and patience. So Krishna says, I am the all devouring death. <clears throat> Sarva haras. Mrityu is Sarva haras. Haras means to, haran means to take away. So death is something that takes away everything. Sarva haras. Now suppose there is someone <clears throat> who wants to rob from us. He may take away some things from us, but death is something that takes away everything. Death takes away our gross body, Death takes away our family. Death takes away our intelligence. Death takes away our belongings. Whatever we have accumulated with so much of hard work throughout our lifetime. Our wealth, our property. Death takes away our beauty. So death is something that takes away everything. So Krishna says that amongst those who take away, amongst all those who devour, he says that I am the all devouring death. Then he says, I am the generating principle of all that is yet to be. So Krishna is not only death, he is also the generating principle. The body undergoes, Srila Prabhupada explains the puppet how the body undergoes uh, changes. No, there is, um, there is birth, then the body grows, then it remains for some time, then the body has byproducts, children, and then there is uh, dwindling and there is death. So like the body is undergoing changes. But before all the changes that the body can undergo, the body is actually being formed in the womb of the mother, isn't it? So Krishna is saying that that generating principle, that is me. So I am the generating principle of all that is yet to be, Krishna is saying. Then he says, among women, I am fame, fortune, fine speech, memory, intelligence, steadfastness and patience. So these are all nouns. And these are feminine nouns. So he's saying that amongst those feminine nouns, these are the more prominent ones. These are the ones that make a person very attractive. What are they? Fame, fortune, fine speech, memory, intelligence, steadfastness, and patience. See, coming to this thing of time being Sarvahara, we should understand that. We, from this, we should, we should uh, understand how to prioritize our life, no? Most of the time, most of the human population prioritizes, um, we keep the more important things for later. What is the most important? What is what is an emergency in our life is Krishna consciousness? Because death can strike at any time. Death can strike at any time and take everything away from us. No matter whether we are young or old, rich or poor, Indian or American, man or woman, it does not matter. Death can strike at any time and take everything else away from us. So what matters is what is how much we have accumulated in our spiritual bank balance. That is the, that is an emergency that we have to work on. This is how we should prioritize. 
So what happens is, what we do is, we say, okay, right now I'm very busy. A student may say, right now I'm very busy with my exams and my studies. Somebody who has just started a job may say, okay, I'm still young. I have to make money. I have to form my family. So I will I will keep spirituality for later. And then when one is newly married, I and one may say, oh, I have my responsibilities. I have my wife, my husband, my children. I have to take care of my children. I have to bring up my children. So I will keep spirituality for later. And then as one is... Um, uh, growing old then there are grandchildren and <laughs> so we always keep spirituality for later no for later see here here one thinks one is too young to think about god then one is too self-sufficient to think about god then one is too happy to think about god too tired to think about god too busy to think about god and finally death strikes sarvahara then it is unfortunately too late to think about god so we should um we should, we should learn to prioritize in the proper way. So when the immediate encroaches me repeatedly on the ultimate, what is the ultimate? The ultimate is our spiritual well-being. So an immediate maybe okay, right now we may have some duties that we have to look into, you no, know, as we discussed, family or um, studies or job, whatever it is. But if the immediate is repeatedly encroaching coming in the way of the ultimate importance then we immediately need a reality check we have to immediately um, learn to prioritize appropriately you can read this article by chaitanya charan prabhu very nice article when i share the slides in the group okay let's go to 35 Dr. Hems, I am the Sama Veda. I, I am the Bharat, Bharat Sama and of poetry, I am the Gayatri. A month, I am Varga Sisa, November to December, and of seasons, I am flower bearing spring. For the hymns in the Sama Veda, I am the Brihat Sama. So, Brihat Sama is a very melodious song of the Sama Veda. It's the most prominent song of the Sama Veda. So, that's why Krishna is saying, Of the hymns in the Sama Veda, I am Brihat Sama. And of poetry, I am the Gayatri. So, uh, there are many rules and regulations in Sanskrit and the Gayatri mantras uh, are the perfect compositions amongst all the different compositions. It is of course received um, when one receives the second initiation only from the spiritual master. In Iskand we have first and second initiations. When one receives the second initiation, one receives the Gayatri mantras. Then of the months, I am Marga Shesha, November and December. November and December is a time when uh, people are generally happy because the grains are, are ready, the, the crops are ready. So that is, a, that, is a, that is a time when everybody is in a good mood. Then of the seasons, I am flower bearing spring. Spring is the best amongst all the four seasons. It's neither too hot, neither too cold. No, the flowers are blooming. Everything is in a very happy, um, the ambience, the whole ambience is very positive and happy. So Krishna says, of all the seasons, I am the flower-bearing spring. 36. Dhyutam chalayatam asmi tejas tejas vinamaham jayosmi vyavasayosmi sattvam sattvavatamaham Also the gambling of trees and of the splendid, I am the splendor. I am victory, I am adventure, and I am the strength of the strong. I am also the gambling of the cheats. See, <laughs> there are different kinds of cheaters who try to cheat people in so many different ways. And normally, when, when you know that somebody is a cheater, what do you do? We, we try to maintain our distance from such people, isn't it? We don't want to associate with a cheater because we know that this person may cheat me. But amongst the all the different kinds of cheaters, the biggest cheaters, the most prominent cheaters are the gambling houses. Because in a gambling house, everybody knows that it is more probable that one will lose than one will gain money. 
ultimately one ends up on the losing side it is the whole system in a casino in a gambling house is designed such that they will gain they will not lose okay so amongst the cheats krishna says i am the gambling because it is it is the place where people willingly go knowing fully well that they are going to be cheated if the gambling houses if the casinos were designed so that we win and they lose then they will be bankrupt and they would not be existing anyway so but but, but casino is a place where people willingly go knowing fully well that there is more probability that one will end up at the losing side so he is saying that all, i am the gambling of the cheats then of the splendid i am the splendor when something is very very wonderful something is very very splendid what is it that makes the thing splendid it's the splendor of that person or that particular thing so krishna is saying of the splendid i am the splendor then i am victory krishna says when one emerges victorious if one is playing a game and one emerges victorious then one feels happy elated uh joy joyful isn't it so that that thrill and that excitement that one that one gets when one emerges victorious that krishna says i am victory we may not be even participating in a match we may just be watching a match uh, maybe a football match or a cricket match on television but when the side that we are supporting uh, emerges victorious then we feel so happy and elated and and joyful so that's why krishna is saying i am victory then what krishna says i am one second i need to move this i am adventure fast saying i am adventure so even an ad the thrill that one experiences in an adventure for example if somebody is jumping off an airplane and just before he hits the ground he opens the parachute or somebody is running towards the train towards a moving train in the opposite direction and moves away from the track just when the train is about to clash with him so these are all adventures so the thrill and joy that one experiences in in adventure that that is that thrill is a different feeling so krishna is saying i am adventure of course these are all <clears throat> these are all uh, stupid and silly things to do is not something that uh, we want to encourage people to do but just to understand what is the thrill and victory and adventure that a devotee experiences is the is the joy and the victory one gains by defeating maya hmm? the adventure krishna consciousness itself is a great adventure is is a thrill at every moment when anyone who is in krishna consciousness will be able to tell you how krishna is an adventure at every moment every step every day is a new adventure because krishna uh, reciprocates you know, the way and krishna is yogeshwar so how krishna is the master magician and how how krishna consciousness itself is a thrilling adventure um, you can know when one is in krishna consciousness then krishna says i am the strength of the strong so the opulence of strength in people who are strong that opulence that strength krishna says is me <clears throat> let's go to 37 vrishni nam vasudevo smi पांडवानां धनंजय मुनीनाम्यहम व्यास कवीनामुशना कवि ऑफ द डिसेंडेंट्स ऑफ वृष्टि आई एम वासुदेव एंड एंड ऑफ द पांडवस आई एम अर्जुन ऑफ द सेजेस आई एम व्यास एंड अमंग ग्रेट थिंकर्स आई एम उषाना of the descendants of rishni i am vasudev what does that name vasudev mean krishna son of vasu son of vasudev no krishna's vasudev. father's name is vasudev but here krishna is describing his opulences so he is saying among the descendants of rishni i am vasudev so who could he be referring to here who could be the other son of vasudev that he is referring to here balaram balaram yes very nice so here rashila prabhupada explains the purport that the vasudev here is balaram then of the pandavas i am arjuna say who is the eldest amongst the pandavas yudhishthir yudhishthir but here krishna is not saying of the pandavas i am yudhishthir even it was uh, yudhishthir was one who was crown king yudhishthir was the eldest but he is saying of the pandavas i am arjuna if you read the mahabharat and you read the section 
where um, Pandu requested Kunti to invoke different demigods so that they can have sons because Pandu was cursed. He was cursed that if he unites with any woman, it would mean death. But now, so Pandu was not able to reunite with his wives so that he can have children, but he wanted to have children. And then he knew, he learned from Kunti herself that she has this mantra that was given to her by Durvasa Muni. By, by using the mantra, she was able, she can invoke any Devata and she can have children because of that mantra. So when Pandu came to know of this, he requested Kunti uh, to, to do it, no? And uh, initially, the first firstborn he wanted would should be a person who is uh, religious, who is uh, Dharmaraj, who is righteous. Why he wanted a righteous person as his firstborn is because it's more probable usually that the firstborn is crowned the next king. And it's very important that the king is a person who is always righteous, no? because a king should uh, should be able to rule in the right way. Otherwise, there will be chaos in the kingdom. So he wanted his firstborn to be someone who is righteous. And therefore, Kutti invoked whom to have her firstborn? Yama. Dharmaraj. Yeah, Yamaraj. No, Yamaraj is mm -hmm. Dharmaraj. So who can be more righteous than Dharmaraj? So therefore, she invoked uh, Yamaraj and then she had Yudhishthir. Then Pandu wanted to have a very, very powerful son because when one is ruling, one is in a kingdom, one, one, needs, to, one needs to have someone who is also very powerful because one has to face wars and so many other adversities. <clears throat> so he wanted a very, very powerful son. And therefore, whom did Kunti invoke? Surya Dev? Pavan. Pavan. Pavan Dev. Yes, Pavan Dev. <clears throat> so then who was born? Beam. Beam, isn't it? So Beam, we know that Beam was very, very powerful. Then uh, Pandu wanted someone who is going to be favored by the Lord. One who is favored by the Lord. If one is favored by the Lord, then automatically um, that person already has righteousness and also is going to be powerful. So then who was invoked? Indra. Indra. Why Indra? Because he he was the most mightiest. Uh, he was head of the um, devatas. He was a head of the devatas. Yes. So he wanted someone who was favored by the Lord. Pandu wanted someone, a son who will be favored by the Lord. So Indra. So what is the connection? Indra is the king of heaven, as Lavina said. So what is the connection? Archer. What's that, Ranjit? He was great archer, archery. Yeah, but he didn't want a son who's a great archer. He wanted a son who is favored, who has the favor of the Lord. Yeah, Shivani has raised her hand. And now all the demigods, Krishna says, I am... Indra, is that the reason? Okay, but what is the connection between having a son who is favored by the Lord and then invoking Indra? Why Indra? How can Indra give him a son who will be favored by the Lord? Was Indra favored by the Lord? Um, can you give us a little clue or him? No. Was Indra favored by the Lord? Whenever there was any attack by the demons or the asuras yes. or any yes, kind yes, of attack yes. and Indra's position was at risk, did the Lord yes. help him? He was favored yes, by the Lord. Yes, he was the yeah. one. So many times, so many times, isn't it? The Lord came to help Indra. So that Indra's position is not uh, taken away as the king of heaven. So Indra was greatly favored by the Lord. Therefore, uh -huh. when Pandu, Pandu wanted a son who was favored by the Lord, Kunti invoked Indra and he got Arjuna. So Arjuna is that personality who has the favor of the Lord. So automatically he is righteous and automatically he is powerful. Hmm? Because spiritual strength is far greater than physical strength, material strength. So what does it mean that I am, I am Arjun in Pandava? 
See, the whole section, Krishna is mentioning a group of people and the more prominent among them, Krishna says the opulence of that person represents my opulence. So the opulence of Arjuna represents the opulence of Krishna, like that. Because Arjuna is the more prominent amongst the five Pandavas. And that, that opulence of Arjuna is a representation of the opulence of Krishna. The whole section is like that. Okay. Thank you, Mahatma. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Then he says, of the sages, I am Vyasa. So Vyasa Dev is, is the empowered incarnation. He is empowered. He is a Shaktiya Vesha avatar. He is empowered to put all the scriptures into writing. He wrote everything on palm leaves. Now, who can do that? Imagine the vast literature, vast scripture, so much Shastra. Who can actually write all of that on palm leaves? So Vyasa Dev was empowered for this impossible task. Therefore, Krishna is saying, of the sages, I am Vyasa. And amongst great thinkers, I am Ushana. Who is Ushana? Ushana is the priest of the demons. Shukracharya. Another name of Shukracharya is Ushana. Now, Ushana was a great, um, I mean, he could, he he was a great thinker. He was very, very intelligent. And he could, he was a very far-seeing person. He, he was very far-sighted. What is the one far-sighted thing that he did? Prominent thing in the pastime of Bali Maharaj. Who remembers? He told Bali not to give... Uh... Not to give uh, the dan to Vaman, Vaman, De, Vaman, Vaman God. Why? Because he knew that he is in the he is Vishnu himself. Yes. And uh, he will just send the demons. Yes, exactly. So, uh, he knew very well that this dwarf Brahman is none other than the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, therefore, he warned Bali that do not uh, accept the request of uh, this dwarf Brahman. So, he was farsighted. He could see. He's a great thinker. Therefore, he's saying, I'm a great thinker. I'm Oshana. Okay, 38. Okay, okay. Dando Damayata Masmi Niti Rasmi Jigishatam Maunam Chaivasmi Guhyanam Jnanam Jnanavatamaham Among all means of suppressing lawlessness, I am punishment. And of those who seek victory, I am morality. Of secret things, I am silence. And of the wise, I am the wisdom. Among all means of suppressing lawlessness, I am punishment, Krishna is saying. See, if somebody is misbehaving, somebody is not following the rules and regulations, even in on the material platform, then there are so many ways to reform a person. No, one, one may reform a person by giving some advice, some counseling can be done. You can politely say, and you can try to reform the person. But ultimately, when one punishes, then that is the uh, most prominent way of reforming the person. Because sometimes counseling and advice will not work. But when one gives a harsh punishment, then the person will say, okay, I will not repeat it again. The same thing with children. No? Sometimes when the parents are very politely, they tell the children, okay, don't do this, this is this, this is this, but they may not listen. Then finally, the parent may choose to punish the child. Then the child will not repeat it again. So Krishna is saying, amongst all means of suppressing lawlessness, I am punishment. So even in countries, different governments, they have different ways. There are jails, there is a police force, there is the army. So like that, uh, the lawlessness can be suppressed by punishment. Of those who seek victory, I am morality. Let us see this. We'll see this in the next slide. Let's proceed here. Of secret things, I am silence. So the, the best way to keep a secret is not to speak it. It's just to not... I mean, just zip the, just shut up, isn't it? Just, so of the secret things, I am silent. Secret, secrets does not mean that I know a secret and I tell somebody, okay, you know what? I'll tell you something, but don't tell it to anybody else. Then that person will tell somebody else, you know what? I'll tell you the secret, but don't tell it to somebody else. People actually get more joy in revealing that they have, a, they know a secret. 
So therefore, they want to reveal it to somebody to, sh to show that, look, I know the secret. Hmm? It's not that they are getting joy out of knowing the secret. So the, the secret does not remain a secret. It spreads equally. So the best way to keep a secret is to remain silent. So Krishna is saying, of secret things, I am silence. And of the wise, I am wisdom. So when somebody is wise, the, 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 the attractive quality of a wise man is what is the wisdom. So Krishna is saying that opulence represents me. Now let's see this. Of those who seek victory, I am morality. See in Vedic culture, there are three codes of conduct, system of morals, niti that are mentioned. What are they? Brihaspati niti, Shukra niti and Kanika niti. So what is Brihaspati niti? It is named after Brihaspati, priest of the demigods. It says the end should be moral and virtuous. The means should also be moral and virtuous. So the means to get to the end both should be moral and virtuous the means also should be moral and virtuous and also the end should be moral and virtuous no matter what someone does to you always follow dharma from your end let others do bad you do good so yudhishthir maharaj followed this meticulously so brihaspati niti means the means should be moral and virtuous and the end also should be moral and virtuous then comes to then comes Shukraniti. It is named after Shukracharya, the priest of the demons. As per this policy, as long as the end is good, the means does not matter. One can use bad means also for good ends. So sometimes, especially in Kali Yoga, it may be very, very difficult for one to follow Brihaspati Niti. So in such emergency situations, it is okay, depending on the circumstances, to use Shukraniti. Even in the Mahabharat war, Sometimes Shukraniti was used. But the worst of all is Kanika Niti. What is Kanika Niti? It is named after a Brahmana named Kanika who was a friend of Shakuni, the maternal uncle of the Kauravas. Shakuni used Kanika to persuade Dhritarashtra who was although attached to Duryodhan but had some moral sense due to which he was always apprehensive towards Shakuni's evil schemes against the Pandavas. According to Kanika Niti, if somebody is your enemy, then there should be no hesitation in adopting any means for the sake of destruction of the enemy. There is no mention of following dharma in this niti. The only objective is one's own prosperity irrespective of whether it is in harmony with the higher principles of life. Here, neither the end nor the means matter. Only one's prosperity and success matters. So, Brihaspati niti. The end and the means, both should be moral and virtuous. In Shukra Niti, the end should be moral and virtuous. Sometimes for that, one may have to use bad means. But in Kanika Niti, neither the end nor the means matter. Only what matters is prosperity and success. So in under no case, Kanika Niti should be used. Okay, 39. Furthermore, O Arjuna, I am the generating seed of all existences. There is no being, moving or non-moving, that can exist without me. So furthermore, O Arjuna, I am the generating seed of all existence. There is no being, moving or non-moving that can exist without me. So Krishna is again reinforcing the fact that he is not just the opulences that he has mentioned previously, but he is everything. He is a generating seed of all existences. Nothing can exist without Krishna. Krishna is saying, and the generating seed. If there is no seed, there is no fruit. There is no tree. There is no plant. There is no growth. There is no life. So Krishna is saying that he is that generating seed from which everything has come into existence. Krishna says, there is no being, moving or non-moving, that can exist without me. So Krishna is uh, making it very clear that it's he is not only what he has mentioned previously in these opulences, but he is everything that can everything that can exist is existing because of him. So here is a summary of all the opulences that Krishna has mentioned in from verse twenty to verse thirty nine. So. 
this you can go through when I share the slides in the group. Let's go to 40. Nanto stimamadivyanam vibhuti nam parantapa esha tu desha ta prokto vibhute ervistaro mayam. O mighty conqueror of enemies, there is no end to my divine manifestations. What I have spoken to you is but a mere indication of my infinite opulences. So Krishna is saying there is no end to my divine manifestation. That's why his vibhutis, Krishna and his opulences all are unlimited. So there is no end. What I have spoken to you, Krishna says, is a mere indication. It's only a small, tiny bit, a small spark of the infinite opulences of Krishna. Krishna himself is saying, what I have spoken to you is but a mere indication of my infinite opulences. So what Krishna has done is he has given us um, examples to understand his opulences. What is the purpose of an example? The purpose of a purpose of using an example is for us to understand that which we cannot understand. If I want to understand something that I cannot understand and I'm given an example which I can understand, if I can understand the example, then I can understand the concept which I cannot understand. For example, <laughs> there was this occasion when once uh, a drug addict asked Srila Prabhupada, what is the joy like uh, if one, that one experiences when one goes to Vaikuntha or Goloka? And Srila Prabhupada was very well aware that he is a drug addict. So Srila Prabhupada told him that the joy in Vaikuntha, the joy in Goloka is like floating in an ocean of LSD. So, so Prabhupada is giving him the example of LSD because he is a drug addict and he will understand through that example. If Srila Prabhupada has said that the joy in Vaikuntha and Goloka is several times more than compared to the joy that one receives when one is in the Brahma Jyoti, that person will not understand understood because he does not know what is Brahma Jyoti, first of all, isn't it? So examples are given so that one can understand that which is otherwise uh, ununderstandable and that is what krishna has done he has chosen different groups of objects people and he's chosen the more prominent among them and then he says that that opulence represents me that doesn't mean that krishna is equal to all these people that doesn't mean that krishna is equal to arjuna or krishna is equal to uh, indra or and airavat and uh, Uchishwara, it's not that it does not mean that all these opulences are actually representing the opulence of Krishna. So that is all that is only a spark of Krishna's unlimited opulences. 41. Yad yad vibhuti mat satvam Shri madur jitam evavam Tatta deva bagat Know that all opulent, beautiful, and glorious creations spring but from but a spark of my splendor. All opulent, beautiful, and glorious creations. So sometimes we may see something so beautiful. No, one one spends money, one takes the time out to go and see some beautiful, wonderful, uh, scenic places, nature, and we say, oh, this is so beautiful. But Krishna is saying that all the opulent, beautiful, and glorious creations are springing from only a spark of my splendor. Srila Prabhupada would say that if the creation is so beautiful, how much more beautiful would the creator be? If the creation is so attractive, then how much more attractive will the one who has brought all this into existence be? That is the beauty, that is the glory, that is the splendor of Krishna. So know from all opulent, beautiful and glorious creations spring from but a spark of my splendor, Krishna says. See, by all these examples that Krishna has given Arjuna and to us, we it facilitates us to remember Krishna in our daily activities. See, Krishna said that I am the taste in water. So every time we drink water, one we can be reminded, oh yes, 
this when we drink water and it quenches our thirst which no, nothing else can do we may have juices and fruits and and soft drinks but only water can quench the thirst so every time we drink water we can think of that was oh krishna says that i am the taste and water when krishna says that he is the amongst all the things that are shining in the sky he is the sun or oh, he says that amongst the stars i am the moon so when we see the sun when we see the moon when we see a horse when we see the elephant when we see water immediately we should be reminded of krishna so like that we can completely krishna eyes our consciousness Arjuna has to fight a war. He's on a battlefield. He has to fail, face all these Brahmastra. He has to kill and fight the very people he loves the most. So at the same time, Krishna is saying, you fight the war at the same time, you have to think of me. So how can Arjuna do that? So therefore, Krishna is mentioning all these opulences so that Arjuna can be reminded of Krishna in the daily, day-to-day -day activities that he sees. So here is a sample of Krishna's infinite manifestations, both in the spiritual and material worlds. So you can see this carefully, clockwise beginning from the upper left corner. From here, you can see all these descriptions are there in this paragraph. You can see this when I share the slide in the group. Now, what are Krishna's reasons for speaking his glories? Of course, we know textually, Arjuna requested Krishna and therefore, in response to Arjuna's request, Krishna is describing his glories. But circumstantially, what is the reason he wants to help Arjuna to remember Krishna on the battlefield, what we just discussed, by seeing various displays of power as divine opulences. So in circumstances that, yes, there is a war, they are in the middle of a battlefield, and Krishna wants Arjuna to remember him, despite having to fight this great war universally why is he describing his opulences provide us guidelines and examples for seeing the opulent things around us as pointers to krishna so there is no excuse for one to forget krishna whatever we see around us whatever is glorious that is only an indication of the glory of krishna is only an indication of the opulence of krishna so by this we can we can uh, as i said we can krishna eyes spiritualize our consciousness. This is the reason why Krishna is speaking his glories. Not because he wants to blow his own trumpet. Theme of 10.41, everything opulent, beautiful and powerful springs from a spark of his splendor. Everything opulent, beautiful, glorious or strong should be seen as simply part of Krishna's splendor because all opulences, even those are not specifically mentioned in this chapter, emanate from Krishna. So even those which Krishna has not mentioned, even those are coming from Krishna. So Krishna concludes this chapter by repeating his basic message, but he adds one more point. What is that? Let us see. ಏಕಾಂಶೇನಸ್ಥಿಗವದ್ಗೀತಾಸೂಪನಿಷತ್ಸುಬ್ರಹ್ಮವಿದ್ಯಾಂಗಶಾಸ್ತ್ರೀ
what need is there arjuna for all this detailed knowledge with a single fragment of myself i pervade and support this entire universe krishna is saying so this is the last verse of the chapter krishna concludes by saying that there is no need what is the need for all this detailed knowledge the point is with a single fragment of myself i pervade and support this entire universe now who remember now when he is referring to some that fragment of krishna who is pervading and supporting this entire universe which personality is he referring to which personality is pervading even the atoms and every living entity from lord brahma to the small ant paramatma yes the paramatma no or shirodakashai vishnu shirodakashai vishnu is coming from or let's start from the beginning from krishna comes krishna's Sarvodha first expansion Sarvodha. is no krishna's first Sarvodha. expansion is balaram balaram from balaram come mahavishnu no mahavishnu is krishna's first expansion in the material world but if we have to start from the spiritual world the hierarchy from krishna comes balaram from balaram come the first quadruple expansion or the chaturvyuha then from them comes narayan from narayan comes the second quadruple expansion or the second chaturvyuha from the second chaturvyuha comes now comes mahavishnu from mahavishnu comes garbhodakashay vishnu from garbhodakashay vishnu comes shirodakashay vishnu or the paramatma so that's what krishna is saying with a single fragment of myself that shirodakashay vishnu is only a fragment of krishna and he's saying with a single fragment of myself i pervade and support this entire universe not only this universe but all the universes with this krishna is concluding this chapter see here you have it from krishna comes balaram from balaram come the first quadruple expansion then from them comes narayan then you have the second quadruple expansion and then we have the three vishnus so you have here brahma vishnu mahesh which is which we popularly uh, refer to them as no brahma vishnu mahesh now what happens is krishna the avatari when he descends to the material world he is coming through the gateway of vishnu because vishnu is the maintainer no he is the maintainer of the universe so when krishna descends he is coming through the gateway of vishnu so it appears as though krishna the avatar is is an is coming from vishnu that's why popularly it is said that krishna is an avatar of vishnu but before this we should understand that this vishnu has come into existence because of krishna <clears throat> so vishnu is only the gateway through which krishna descends to the material world so krishna the avatari is here he is coming to the gateway of vishnu and then the descent therefore it is uh, he is popularly referred to as the krishna avatar can i ask you a question <clears throat> yes so uh, the avatari krishna and the uh, shape of avatari krishna and avatara krishna same 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 krishna how he resides in the spiritual world in the same spiritual body he is appearing even in the material world there is no difference okay so chapter 10 fixes our mind fully in krishna chapter 10 thoroughly describes different opulences and expansions of krishna's energy and thus one can fix one's mind in full krishna consciousness every time we drink water now we should remember krishna every time we see the sunrise we see the sun we see the stars we see the moon we should think of krishna balade hmm? vidyabhushana concludes chapter 10 by saying from krishna's potent energy even the sun gets its power and by krishna's partial expansion the whole world is maintained so the sun is so powerful it's there from so many millions and millions and millions of years you cannot even trace no? and it's continuously giving heat and light continuously so the 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 potency has not reduced so the sun is so powerful but even the sun gets its power from krishna so therefore the therefore lord krishna is worshipable therefore he is worshipable so here you have a summary verse by verse summary which again you can read when i when i share the slides in the group
And with this, by the mercy of Guru and Krishna, we come to the end of chapter number 10. Srila Prabhupada ki Jai. Shri Mataji Gita ki Jai. 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 Thank you, Mataji. Shila Prabhupada ki Jai. Koti Koti Danvat Param to your sins of Seva Hare Krishna. Thank you, Mataji. Koti Koti Param. Jai Shila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Does anybody have any question or comments? Hello, auntie. Okay, so from the previous class, Shivani, you remember you had a question? I don't remember now, Mataji. Okay, in the previous class, we answered your question on Bhakti Lata Beach. I don't know because you were not present in the, in the first few minutes of the class. So we, we had a Shastric quote to answer that question. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the recording, but if you have not seen the recording, then I request you to please see the recording of the previous class, last week's class, and see the first few minutes. There we have a Shastric quote to answer your question on the Bhakti Lata Beach. Okay, and in the previous class, you wanted to know the story of yeah, yeah, the Yamraj. Ah, yes, very nice. So we will read directly from the Bhagavatam. See here, Vidura, Srila Prabhupada writes, one of the prominent figures in the history of Mahabharat. So we are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 13, uh, Verse 1. Vidura, one of the prominent features in the history of Mahabharat, he was conceived by Vyasadev in the womb of the maid servant of Ambika, mother of Maharaj Pandu. He is the incarnation of Yamaraj. Being cursed by Manduka Muni, he was to become a Shudra. The story is narrated as follows. Once upon a time, the state police caught some thieves who had concealed themselves in the hermitage of Manduka Muni. The police constables, as usual, arrested all the thieves and Manduka Muni along with them. The magistrates specifically punished the Muni to death by being pierced with a lance. Thus, uh, I'm sorry, when he was just to be pierced, the news reached the king and he at once stopped the act on consideration of his being a great Muni. The king personally begged the Muni's pardon for the mistake of his men and the saint at once went to Yamaraj, who prescribes the destiny of living beings. Yamaraj, being questioned by the Muni, replied that the Muni in his childhood pierced an ant with a sharpened straw. And for that reason, he was put into difficulty. The Muni thought it unwise on the part of Yamaraj that he was punished for his childish innocence. And thus the Muni cursed Yamaraj to become a Shudra. And the Shudra incarnation of Yamaraj was known as Vidura, the Shudra brother of Dhritarashtra and Maharaj Pandu. But the Shudra son of the Kuru dynasty was equally treated by Bhishma Dev along with his other nephews. And in due course, Vidura was married with a girl who was also born in the womb of a Shudrani by a Brahmana. Although Vidura did not inherit the property of his father, the brother of Bhishma Dev, still he was given sufficient state property by Dhritarashtra, the elder brother of Vidura. Vidura was very much attached to his elder brother and all along he tried to guide him on the right path. During the fratricidal war, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, of Kurukshetra, Vidura repeatedly implored his elder brother to do justice to the sons of Pandu, but Duryodhan did not like such interference by his uncle, and thus he practically insulted Vidura. This resulted in Vidura's leaving home for pilgrimage and taking instructions from Maitreya. So this is the story, Shivani. How Manduka Muni found fault with the judgment that Yamaraj had passed. He, he thought that out of childishness, he pierced the ant with a straw. And because of that, he had to go through that um, anxiety. He was not pierced, of course. The king ordered that he should not be killed. But imagine the anxiety that he had to go through when he was just about to be pierced by a lance. Very, very painful death. So he found fault with the judgment of Yamaraj and he cursed Yamaraj to become a Shudra. And that was Vidura. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much for sharing. So, Mataji, uh, just one question. Like, is there a certain age, like before, like when you're a child or very young, certain age where you are, if you do something wrong or something like to this sort, that you are forgiven? It doesn't count. Yeah, I've heard my Guru Maharaj that 
till the age of five years, whatever the child does, the mother takes the karma till the age of five years. After that, the child makes his own karma. Okay, so, uh, oh, okay. But still, so, mother take the karma? What's that? Mother takes the karma, right? Yes, mother takes mother the karma of the child till the child is five years old. Okay. So, why not the father? Why everything goes to the mother? <laughs> Because, the, see, the Vedic society has divided the roles. According, see, the prescribed duties for a man and woman have been, have been divided by the society. And the prescribed duty of a woman is to take care of the child, the family, the home. Okay. And the prescribed duty of a man is to financially support the family, support all the needs of the society. Now, these roles have been created according to the nature. Now, by nature, a woman is more patient and more loving. Therefore, according to the nature of a woman, the prescribed duties of a woman have been given. And a man's nature is different. No, the man, the man thinks more from the head. The woman is all about the heart, more about the emotions. So therefore, the nature of a woman is such that it is suitable for taking care of the children and the family and the home. And the nature of a man, because he thinks more from the head, is more suitable for him to go out and financially support the family because then there are less chances that he will be cheated. It's easier to manipulate a woman than to manipulate a man only because of the nature of a woman because she thinks more from the heart she is more emotional than the man okay so because it's a prescribed duty of a woman to take care of the children therefore the mother takes the karma not the father okay in kalyug i mean there are women who are more cunning and more you know manipulative than men i mean I just everything goes to women for some reason. I mean, they have to bear everything. Anyway. Yeah, they have to bear everything. That's the reason why the society has divided the duties so that the woman does not have to be stressed out. See, now in the modern times, what I'm not against uh, working women and all that. I'm just saying, according to Shastra, the duties have been divided very clearly according to the nature of a person. So therefore, there is no... Um, there is no clash. There is no conflict. Now, in the modern times, what happens is the woman, she try, she has to balance job. If she's going for a job, she has to manage the job, has to go out. And then at the same time, then take care of the children, take care of the family. So the women are stressed out. Women are stressed out. See, it's... Uh, it's um, in the, the modern thinking is that if a woman is a housewife, if a woman is at home taking care of the family and kids, then she is looked down upon. But if a woman is going for a job and she's bringing money, then she is very much appreciated. That is the modern thinking. But it is a faulty thinking because this, this, this narrative has been created uh, for us to believe that. If you see it in the right perspective, the more important role the society and the Shastra, the seniors, the superiors have given to the women. The women have the more important role. Why? Because if you can bring up your children to become righteous and spiritual and you make sure that you bring them up in such a way that they can go back home, back to God, you, know, you are creating people who will be an, a plus to the society. But if those children are not taken care of properly, now if the woman is working and the child is left behind with the maid, or somebody else, a third party. Now that maid is not going to install the values that a mother will install in the instill in the kids. Obviously, right? So therefore, what happens? The children who are being brought up by the maids are not uh, ideally a plus to the society. So they create disturbances in the society. They are not. Um, so what happens is the 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 future of the society is at risk. The whole future of the society, the whole future of the nation depends on how the woman is bringing up the children because they are the future of the society, they are the future of the nation, they are the future of the world. So the more important role has been given to the woman. But in modern times, people have lost this. Um, they think that it is it is less important to take care of your children and home and more important to go out and earn more money. 
okay fine if see if if there is a financial crunch if there is a problem if if the needs are not being able to be met by the man then if the woman works then that is understandable but just because somebody is qualified materially and you leave the child behind and one is working then the child suffers the child needs the time and attention of the parent at least one parent the mother most important that is very very crucial for the upbringing of the child so the more important role, the future, the society and the Vedas and the scriptures have actually entrusted to the woman. Yes, Mataji, you are absolutely correct. It makes a lot of sense because I can see when I was young, being in America, my mom was with us. So the values that she's given us, now I can think back when I have with my kids that, you know, what she's taught me from right to wrong. And I'm glad that she was there for me at that time. Otherwise, you know, who knows? So it makes perfect sense. But it's just, what the thing is, for everything, you know, what you said, it makes sense perfectly. But women have to bear, like you said, if a child is five years and under, whatever he does or she does goes to the mother. I mean, it's like everything, she has to bear every all the consequences. Yeah, because if she fails, see, a five-year-old child, what does a child know? If the if a five-year-old, if a two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old is eating meat, he does not know what he's eating. He's just eating what his mother is giving him, is it not? Yes, does yes, he know? definitely. But if the mother say, if the mother makes sure that the food is offered to the Lord and the child eats prasad, isn't the mother in control of what the child is eating? Yes, but see, at the same time, the mother has to be knowledgeable of all this, right? If ah, she's not knowledgeable, exactly. So that comes then, from her mother. <laughs> that comes from her mother, isn't it? Yeah. So, so the, the reason I'm... why we need to uh, dedicate time and effort, quality time with our kids. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely correct. Thank you so much, Altaji. Hey, this this, this whole narrative of uh, or, uh, what what is it called? Um, feminism and all that. This is all created for the for so that it suits it suits the other category of people. See, I'll tell you one example. In the 1920s, there was this campaign in the US uh, called Torches of Freedom. I think I've mentioned this in the classes before. Torches of Freedom. So this it was advertised widely that why is it that only the men should be allowed to smoke and if a woman smokes why is it looked down upon no there should be equality among men and women and women should not be looked down upon if men can smoke even the women can smoke they have the freedom they have the, the freedom to choose what they want to do so this campaign was going on in america and by the end if within a short period of time even the women a large population of uh, you know, a large women population in america they started to smoke but actually this campaign was carried out by the cigarette companies by the cigarette companies because they realized that they have exhausted the market for men all the men all the possible customers that they could have amongst the male population they had exhausted all of them were smoking but now how to expand the market how can they do more business so they started with this campaign so that the women can start to smoke and then it was yeah on the on the um, under the pretext of equality among men and women they had all the women also smoking so, but it was only a degradation so this kind of narrative is created because it's so see it's it's uh, more advantages for the men so that the women are out in the society so that they can be exploited women it's very easy it's easy it's far easier to exploit a woman than to exploit a man because again women women are more about emotions therefore vedic society always recommends that women should be protected women should be protected so when something is protected doesn't mean that the that thing is weak it means that the person is more precious see if you have a diamond jewelry and you have a plastic toy which is which of the two you're going to keep nicely protected within some satin cloth the plastic toy or the diamond ring well because it is more precious is it not so just because women are meant to be protected doesn't mean that they look at women as the as weak 
or unimportant or less important notes because they are more precious. The more important role, the future of society depends on how the woman does her prescribed duties. What the man does, of course, it's important that there is sufficient finances in the house so that the women and the children are comfortable. And if they are living comfortably, then Krishna consciousness spirituality is also easier. If you are suffering and struggling to make ends meet, if it's a struggle to even get one good meal in a day, then spirituality also gets affected, is it not? So yes, a man's role is also important, but the woman's role is more important. Thank you so much, Mataji. This is Vedic system. Yep. Thank you so much for explaining. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Mataji, because Prabhupada teaches us non-violence and tolerance, and if we have mice in our homes and a devotee um, takes mice traps, and then the neck is broken in one after another, so many mice's neck is broken and then they flush it down the toilet. That is not allowable, right? We should just put the mice in a box and just throw it, like keep, take it in the car and, and, and dump it out some, somewhere where, leave it somewhere? Yes, 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 yes. That's right. Because there are mice traps which are ahimsa. They do not... Uh... They do not harm the mice in any way, but the mice are caught because we have to take them out of the house. So you can trap them without harming them and then you take them far away and put them out. That's what we did in our Iskon temple. They were they, For a certain period of time, we had a problem with some rats. So the rats were trapped uh, in an ahimsa way and then they were taken far away and left. So the story that you just told us, like if we don't do that and we kill it with a mouse trap, do we have to take the karma for that? Oh, or our good? Yes, karma, karma we have to take. Now, if we are responsible for causing death, especially when it is not, if, if, if it is in self-defense, then you can be excused. For example, if a lion is coming to attack you and you say, oh, I'm not going to attack the lion, then you will be killed. So if it's in self-defense, then you are excused. But if the, if the mouse is not directly uh, threatening you and if you kill some another living entity, then yes, karmic reaction we have to take. What about self -defense? Self -defense. When mosquitoes bites us? Is that and we kill them? Would that be self defense or no? So as far as possible, you have to use the ahimsa method. If you cannot do it, see there are some um, um, there are some quotes by Shila Prabhupada where he says that if a living entity is is causing a menace, is troubling you, then you can act out of self-defense. But otherwise, as far as possible, you have to avoid. So again, it depends on time, place, and circumstances. An accidental death of an animal, a cockroach or something, an accidental death, then would you take a karma for that? Like, like let's say someone's wearing their slippers and accidentally an animal died, and so... Yeah, so for the for the things that we do unknowingly, like we may we, when we walk on the road, we are killing so many living entities. So when we do something unknowingly, then that can be counteracted by the chanting of the holy name. Okay. That's why chanting is very powerful. If we don't chant, then we have to take the karma. So the things that we do accidentally, that is that can be counteracted by chanting the holy name. Hare Krishna, thank you. Hare Krishna. Ayush, you have your hand raised. Yeah, this is a more of a hypothetical question, but what if uh, humans uh, went in instinct, extinct? That will never happen because there will always be people who will misbehave. All the living entities in this material world, we are all here because we misbehaved when we were in the spiritual world. And there will always be a certain percentage of the people who are going to misbehave. In every country, there will be some percentage of people who are going to commit a crime. That is why you have jails and prison houses in every country. We don't want, the government does not want that there are criminals, but they know that there will be criminals and therefore there is a jail. So that would not happen all the they would uh, disappear from the planet only when Mahavishnu breathes in when there is complete destruction all the living entities go inside the body of Mahavishnu but again when he breathes out everything starts rolling all over again we continue from where we left off okay okay anything else you should discuss small doubt yes Prabhu so the every Tretanga Krishna comes he is not the original Krishna right Krishna doesn't come every Treta Yuga. Krishna comes once in the day of Brahma. 
Yeah, that's what. So every every Treta Yuga Krishna comes, he is an avatar. He is not in every Treta Yuga. That's what I'm saying. He comes once in a day of Brahma. In no, one no, day of Brahma, there are many Treta Yugas. Every Treta Yuga Krishna will be there, right? No. 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 So, Mataji, I have a question. Yes. So, this Mahabharata that we are talking about, it doesn't happen every Teta Yoga. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, it will happen, right? But the Krishna comes... In... Krishna comes once in the day of Brahma. In one day of Brahma, there are so many Treta Yugas. One day of Brahma is... Okay, there are four Yugas. Satya Yuga, Dwapar Yuga, Treta Yuga... Satya Yuga, Treta Yuga, Dwapar Yuga, Kali Yuga. These four Yugas put together make one Divya Yuga. One thousand Divya Yugas make one day in the life of Brahma. So every one thousand Divya Yugas only Krishna appears. He is not here every Treta Yuga. Is this same for uh, Rama as well? I have not read any Shastric quote as to how often Lord Ramachandra appears. I don't know that. But Krishna comes once in the day of Brahma. And every time Krishna appears, he is followed by the appearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But they don't come every Treta Yuga. That's why we are fortunate because we are in the same Divya Yuga cycle in which Krishna and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared. But he doesn't come every Treta Yuga. Thank you, Mataji. You're welcome. Durga Prasad, is your question answered? No, I have confusion that I am thinking every day Krishna will come. But what I know that he is not Krishna, I am thinking. He is not the original Krishna, but he is an avatar, something like that. Okay, so if you have a sharp okay. report, you can share with us in the next class. No, I too don't know, but I have doubt, that's why I am asking. Okay, my understanding is Krishna comes once in the day of Brahma. Yeah, that's correct. But uh, the Krishna comes in once in Brahma. He is the original Krishna. We are from Goloka. But other also Krishna will come. But he is not the original Krishna from Goloka. He is like Avatar, other Avatars, something like that. Okay, then you have to search for it, Durga Prasad. Because from what I have learned, I have not come across this. Okay, Mother. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Hare Krishna, Mataji, the video of today's class and the notes would be a uh, message just now because I have to start my test. <laughs> okay, I can do that. I will Thank put you. up. When is the last day? 15th. Okay. Four days more. Yeah. All right. Anything else we need to discuss? All right then, see you all next week if Krishna so sanctions. Till then, have a nice week in Krishna consciousness. Vancha kalpa taru vyascha, kripa sindhu vyay vacha, patita nam pavanebhyo, vaishna bebhyo namo namaha. Srila Prabhupada ki jai, Shri Bhattagat ki jai. Jai. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.